signs of Parkinson's disease might be obvious. But not at first. The nervous system disorder takes time to progress. By the time it's diagnosed, most people have lost around 50% of their dopamine producing cells. When dopamine levels decrease, the brain struggles to properly control things, such as physical movement and the way we think and talk. Over time, people with Parkinson's tend to develop tremors in hands and fingers and slow body movement, making even simple things much more difficult. It can also cause hallucinations, anxiety, depression, stiffness, and difficulties with speech and writing. The cause of Parkinson's isn't known. Researchers are looking at everything from the role of genetics to environmental factors. What is known is that Parkinson's disease doesn't only affect the elderly. Nearly 1 million people in the U.S. are living with Parkinson's disease. Approximately 60,000 Americans are diagnosed with PD each year. If you are one of those diagnosed, the Parkinson's and Movement Disorder Foundation is here to help you. Today, we have Dr. Deepmala Nananwar of the Parkinson's and Movement Disorder Institute of Orange County, California, to talk about new developments in Parkinson's disease. Hi, my name is Lena Nguyen. Today, I'm here with Dr. Deepmala Nananwar for Parkinson's disease. Um, I'm just going to go straight right into it. Uh, what is Parkinson's disease? Thank you for having me here, first of all. Uh, Parkinson's disease is a progressive neurodegenerative disease that affects the dopaminergic neuron in the brain. Uh, the dopaminergic neuron gets affected because a protein called alpha synuclein, it starts de depositing in the brain. So uh, the deposition of this particular protein starts in a specific part of the brain called substantia nigra. And as the disease advances, the protein start affecting the other part of the brain as well. Patient with Parkinson's disease, they can have a, a motor symptom, which is related to movement. They can also have non-motor symptom, which is non-movement related, like cognitive dysfunction, REM sleep behavior disorder, which means acting out their dream, anosmia, which is poor uh, sense of smell, uh, lightheadedness, constipation, and many others. It's also important to mention here, not every Parkinson patient get all the symptoms. Not all? Not all the patient get all the symptoms. Um, so what happens with the disease progression then? As I said, when the disease progresses, it starts affecting the other part of the brain as well. So a patient may experience worsening of their existing Parkinson's symptom, or they may start developing new symptom. Uh, it's very common for patient to experience on and off episode which means they can experience when medications are working and when medications are not working. And it's also common for them to experience dyskinesia, which is excessive movement. Um, can you discuss more about, uh, am I saying correctly, dyskinesia? Dys yes, that's, that's can correct. Can you discuss more about that? So uh, dyskinesia are excessive wiggling, involuntary movement. Uh, dyskinesia usually starts in Parkinson after patients after they have been on levodopa therapy for few years. Usually, dyskinesia are related when medication, Parkinson medication are working its best. They are called peak dyskinesia. There are some patients who may experience dyskinesia when medication starts working and then when it starts wearing off. These are called biphasic dyskinesia. Also common for Parkinson patient to report dyskinesia toward the end of the day. Okay. Can you um, discuss more about the on and off episodes of Parkinson's? So on and off episode, uh, uh, these are the episode when a patient is start experiencing their medication is are working. So those are on office, on episode. There are also time during the day when a patient feel that the medications are not working as much. Those are called off episode. The uh, prevalence of on and off episode is about 40% after a patient being diagnosed with Parkinson's disease for four to six years. Patient can uh, 
experience usually their medications are not working before they are due for you their next dose. So these are called uh, end dose of episode. Patient can also experience of episode unpredictably. So there is no reason that just medication stops working. Uh. There are times when uh, a patient do not feel their medication is working at all. Those are called dose failure and patients sometimes experience of episode before they take first dose of their Parkinson's medication in the morning. So those are called morning off episode. Patients who have these on or off episode or motor fluctuation, they are more likelihood to have a professional caregiver provider or having a hospitalization compared to patients who do not experience these motor fluctuations. So what is the mechanism behind off episodes? So there are several factors that, have, that causes these off episodes or motor fluctuation. Parkinson's disease, it affects the motility of gut. So uh, poor gastric emptying, difficulty with swallowing, it affects absorption of medication. In some patient, if they take Parkinson's medication along with a high protein meal, then a high protein meal and medication, they can they can compete with each other for getting absorption uh, across the intestinal wall. So that can add to off episode. Uh, as I said, Parkinson's disease is a progressive disease. So patient is keep losing the dopamine neurons in the brain. So their natural reserve of dopamine keeps, keep decreases. This causes fluctuation in the dopamine level in the brain. Also prolonged exposure to the Parkinson's medication in the brain can cause postsynaptic changes in the nerve terminals. So all these things can add for motor fluctuation or off episodes. So how can a patient deal with um, the off episodes if they were to have one? Well, first of all, the most important thing for patient to realize and recognize the off episode. So a provider plays a really important role here because they need to educate the patient about the off episode. Once patient recognize off episode or these motor fluctuation, they, they can see the impact of these motor fluctuation and off episodes are having in their life uh, because it, it makes difficult for patient to plan their day. If they can recognize it, they are more likely to discuss this with their provider and get help. Um, what are treatment options for Parkinson's patients? So there are several treatment options. Uh, the treatment option, also the Parkinson patient treatment, is a multidisciplinary treatment approach. So it involves medications, it also involves uh, therapies. And uh, toward the advanced Parkinson patient, they can have advanced therapy like deep brain stimulation, focused ultrasound, or intestinal levodopa uh, gel therapy. Can you discuss more about on-demand therapy? Absolutely. So uh, on-demand therapies are really useful in patient with motor fluctuation. Uh, the whole idea or the goal with on-demand therapy is to provide rapidness of onset of action so that the off episode can be converted to on episode and patient feel more confident and independent about their day. There are several options available for uh, uh, on-demand therapy. Uh, the one is uh, uh, intravenous epimorphine, which was approved in 2004 uh, by the FDA. The other ones are inhaled levodopa. It was approved in 2018. And then there is sublingual epimorphine film, uh, and which was approved in 2020. So all these therapy can make patient empowered so that they feel more confident about their day. Um, can you tell us more about the, I think, DBC, uh, DBC focus ultrasounds and intestinal level dopa infusion? Yeah, I think you meant DBS. 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 Yes, it's a deep brain stimulation. Yes. So uh, all these therapies are uh, recommended for patient with advanced Parkinson's disease. So uh, you know, all these therapies are helpful when patients start experiencing side effect if their medications are improving, increasing. The advanced Parkinson's therapy are recommended when increasing medication causes side effect. So if we discuss about deep brain stimulation, it's an invasive procedure. 
uh, during the procedure a neurosurgeon puts electrode inside the brain and uh, also a battery is placed usually beneath the skin of the chest and then the electrodes and the battery is connected through wires and uh, uh, the electrode can be used to provide stimulation and that helps with the Parkinson's symptom. One of the good thing about the DBS therapy is it can be programmed and adjusted as disease progresses. Then focused ultrasound uh, is another option. It's a non-invasive therapy, which means that um, it, it's done with neurosurgeon and it's done under MR guidance. So a trained neurosurgeon uses ultrasound energy and it focuses on a specific part of the brain and it causes thermal ablation that provides immediate relief with the Parkinson's symptom. Uh, for now, it can only be done on one part of the brain. And uh, the last about the intestinal levodopa gel therapy. So the idea behind it, because with advanced Parkinson patient, there is fluctuation in the dopamine, which is causing these motor fluctuation. So what happens with continu continuous intestinal levodo levodopa therapy, a tube is placed surgically and through the tube, that levodopa gel, it also has carbidopa, so the carbidopa levodopa gel is uh, directly provided into the intestine. So it prevents the fluctuation of the dopamine and helps with the symptom. Are there any updates to uh, clinical trials? So uh, it's really, hopeful time for Parkinson. There are many clinical trials in the pipeline. And uh, in fact, we are, uh, we are happy and proud to be part of ma many of these clinical trials. Some of the clinical trials are designed to help dyskinesia, some are designed to help with uh, motor fluctuation, and some to slow down the progression of Parkinson's disease. We are actively recruiting patient for uh, uh, Parkinson's disease to participate in various of these trials. And I'm uh, hopeful that uh, soon we would have more therapies available for Parkinson's disease and hopefully some disease modifying therapy. Uh, if it's okay, I, too, I have a few other questions to ask you myself, Absolutely. if you don't mind. Um, levodopa, levodopa mm -hmm. how long can it stay effective for? So uh, levodopa, it's actually the dopamine. Okay. As I said, for a Parkinson patient, they lose the dopamine neurons. So what levodopa does, it directly provides dopamine to the brain. So patient who has early Parkinson, they can start experiencing a significant improvement in their symptoms. But important thing to understand here is Parkinson's disease is a progressive disease. So it is, the symptoms are keep getting worse. The, the dopamine neurons in the brain are keep dying. So it's important to adjust the medication. And uh, what happens when the medication, especially the levodopa, uh, when it reaches to the higher dose, it can cause side effect. Unfortunately, some of the side effect that levodopa causes, it can mimic the same uh, symptom that Parkinson's disease can cause. So like lightheadedness. Lightheadedness can be a symptom from Parkinson's disease itself or uh, levodopa can also cause it. So it's m more about adjusting those medication. Uh, adjusting Parkinson's me medication, it's always a moving target where a patient and a provider needs to work together to give maximum benefit and minimum side effect. And is, so how long can a patient be on level, I'm sorry, level dopa before um, it stopped working? So uh, levodopa itself, it doesn't stop working. Okay. It's more about adjusting that levodopa therapy to, to manage what's the goal for the patient and minimizing the side effect. So it's more about disease progression rather okay. than medication stop working. Okay. Um, so is it hereditary? So there are 15% of the Parkinson patient who has a family member with diagnosis of Parkinson's disease but majority of Parkinson's disease is sporadic, which means there is no family history available. There are many genes which has been associated with Parkinson's disease, but a patient may carry the gene, but can never develop symptom of Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease is more about combination of genetic factor as well as environmental factor. 
Um, does Parkinson's, I'm just curious, does it show up on MRIs at all, if you were to? Uh, so MRI, uh, MRI is a good imaging modality, but it does not provide a direct evidence of Parkinson's disease. MRI is more useful to make sure the patient does not have other disease, like there are atypical Parkinsonism, which may show some subtle sign on MRIs. Also, vascular Parkinson is another thing that needs to be uh, keep in mind when doing these uh, uh, imaging studies. Uh, so, MRI itself does not provide a direct evidence for Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is a clinical diagnosis and there is an imaging modality called DAT scan which actually look for the dopamine neurons in the brain. So uh, it can provide, it can help a physician to make diagnosis of Parkinsonism. Unfortunately, DET scan does not differentiate uh, idiopathic Parkinson's disease from atypical Parkinsonism. So at the end, it's uh, about the clinical diagnosis. Um, is there other diseases that can be like, mistaken for Parkinson's? Because when we talk about it freely with me, they're like, oh yeah, they, they have Parkinson's, but they, it's like a self-diagnosis, right? They refuse to go see a doctor. Um, are, are there other diseases out there that could be mistaken for Parkinson's that is not? Mm -hmm. Yes, so, you know, unfortunately, we do not have any single test available which can say, hey, this patient has Parkinson's disease or this one doesn't. Uh, there are many diseases that can mistaken for Parkinson's disease. One of the very common one is essential tremor. And so essential tremor patient can be diagnosed as Parkinson or Parkinson patient can be diagnosed as essential tremor. So it's a very uh, common misdiagnosis which, which can be made, especially in an early part of the Parkinson's disease because patient may not show other symptoms as much. Uh, there are other diseases as, as well which can be mistaken for idiopathic Parkinson's disease like atypical Parkinsonism and uh, drug-induced Parkinsonism. So th these are the things needs to be kept in mind. Um, does Parkinson's, um, do, do they cause dementia? Is that one of the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like patients with Parkinson's, do they get dementia? So yes, patient with Parkinson, especially in their advanced uh, uh, stage of the disease, they can develop dementia. Uh, Parkinson patient is about three to six times at a higher risk of developing dementia compared to the age based population. Uh, but it happens, it takes many years to decades for a Parkinson patient to develop dementia. If dementia is coming on early stage of disease or it's a presenting symptom of the Parkinson itself, then there is other diagnosis that needs to be explored beside idiopathic Parkinson's disease. And uh, my last question is not one I don't like to ask, but what's the most common death in Parkinson's patients? Um, you know, the Parkinson's disease patient, they do not die because of Parkinson itself, but the common cause of death if it's related to Parkinson, is the complication with Parkinson. So like falls, pneumonia, it's important both for a patient and provider to be vigilant about balance problem or uh, dysphagia. So a balance problem can cause fall. If a patient has fall, they can have fracture in their hip. They can also have bleeding in their brain. This is especially become more uh, critical for patient who takes blood thinner for other medical reason. So it's important for patient to discuss if they ex start experiencing any balance problem to discuss this with their uh, provider. And this can be managed with physical therapy. Dys dysphagia is difficulty with swallowing. So uh, if a patient starts having difficulty with swallowing, they can aspirate their food and it can cause pneumonia. So all these things needs is, is very important, and these are the sim these are things that can be deal with like speech therapist. So it's important to have a a team of people. Uh, the team includes physical therapy, speech therapy, caregiver, patient, physician, and many more. Thank you so much for being here today. I actually learned a lot. Um, I, like I said, I don't know anything about Parkinson's and I only learn about them through all social media platforms. And one I saw recently is uh, Michael J. Fox. Um, 
how young can you be? I'm sorry, I had six have last questions. How young can a person be diagnosed for Parkinson's? Because with Michael J. Fox, I believe he was diagnosed at 29. Yeah, so Parkinson's disease, it can happen in the younger individual as well. It's not that common, but yes, it can happen in the younger individual as, as well. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nanunwar, for being here today. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank, Thank you so you. much for having me.